Martin here, and welcome to episode 8 of Recreating Stockholm in the 1920s. Let's start with a recap and also see what's been done so far. So, for any new viewers, what you are looking at is the city building game, City Skylines. That means this is not the conventional 3D modeling tool. I don't have control over everything, it's not optimized for realism, and it's not really designed for what I'm trying to do here. However, doing this in most other modeling tools would take forever, and you wouldn't get the dynamics with simulated citizens, traffic and so on. So I think this is currently the best option to do something like this. Since last time the game got an update, that means that many of the mods had to be updated or replaced and that was a bit of work, but I got some improvements as well. The citizens are now dressed more old-fashioned. They look more like from the 50s now, but at least I got rid of the guy with the skateboard. I also got rid of the modern looking tram stops, except for the green pavement around them. And I replaced the tram tracks with better looking ones, and I also changed the grass and gravel textures. And I replaced a building here and there. And the whole game runs a little bit smoother as well. Okay, this time we will cover everything east of Renskjernasgata and north of Bondegatan. That's a much larger area than I've been able to cover in earlier episodes. I've skipped some of the detailing, as you will see, but I feel that progress is more important than I record every tree I place, and it's still quite a bit of detailing in this one. But this will be fast-paced, so get ready, here we go. As usual, first the streets, using the overlay map. Folkangatan had tram tracks all the way to Dammikstull. Let's start with Fjällgatan. This first building is from the 1860s and was built as a school focused on trade, Handelsinstitutet. Later it contained Radiumhemmet doing early radiotherapy and cancer treatment. And the building next to it contains the vegetarian restaurant Hermans. Fjällgatan looked very similar to what it's like today. This is a school for navigation, built in 1907. And this other prominent building is where the trade school at Fjällgatan moved to in 1915. Today it's called Per Anders Fogelströms Gymnasium, after the well-known author who lived nearby. This height is called Stigberget and was Stockholm's main site for executions during the rule of Gustav Vasa and his heirs. One of the more well-known executioners was Mester Mikael. He performed his profession from 1635 to 1650, when he was convicted for murder and beheaded by his successor. For some reason it was decided to name the part of Fjällgatan west of Renskjernasgata after him. And public executions were banned in Sweden in 1887. This is supposed to represent Eersta sjukhus, but it's not very close. It was built in 1907. Below Stigberget we have Stigbergsparken. The trees are larger today, so it doesn't look as open now, otherwise it's much the same. Before around 1900, some small houses stood here, and also, I believe, a rope walk. 
in Swedish that is Repslagarbana, making ropes for the ships built nearby at the shipyard at Tegelviken. This is Ersta Kyrka, opened in 1872. It's a bit larger than this model, and I scaled it up later, but I didn't record it. Most of these other buildings are now gone, and others have been built instead. Also, this short street called Ersta Backe is gone. This model is a horrible match, but this is Skeps Byggmästar Bostället from 1748, where the head of the shipyard lived. Today it's an art school. It's the only remaining building with connection to the shipyard. At the edge of the cliff lies a garden, still in existence. This short overpass is called London Viadukten, with a very vague connection to London apparently. Some officials from London happened to be present when it was completed. Today it's not really a viaduct anymore, it's just part of the highway from Slussen. Okay, so here is what remained of the shipyard in 1925. Much of the small bay had grounded up and been filled out. Today is just a big parking lot and infrastructure related to the Viking terminal, but it's still called Tegelviken. I'm being a bit sloppy with the buildings here, they seem to have changed during this time, but some kind of magazines stood here. In the 1500s, bricks were manufactured here, hence the name Tegelviken. Later they turned to produce tar. Making tar is pretty risky. Therefore, the production moved to Beckholmen in 1687, and after that the area was turned into a shipyard. Here, ships were built for over 200 years, until the last ship was launched in 1907. Below the hill, with a viewpoint Fåfängan and former fortification Danvik Skans, stood some homes for the workers at Liljeholmen Stearinfabrik. More about that in a minute. There also was a station on Saltkabanan here for a few years, but that was already gone in 1925. Stadskortsleden goes through here today. I managed to cover a bit more than I thought, so I'll draw some more streets. White spots on the map means it was empty at the time. At Stockholmskjellan this map is dated to 1934, but that makes me a bit confused, because the map itself is dated to 1927.
The decision to dig the canal here between Saltsjön and Hammarby Sjö was taken in 1914 and it was finished just around the time of this model. I will talk more about that in the next episode. Okay, so here we had Liljeholmen's Stearinfabrik. It was founded in 1839 by Lars Johan Hjerta, who also founded Aftonbladet. The factory was making stearine candles and was of course located in Liljeholmen, but it moved here to Domix Tull after only two years and remained here for some 130 years. But the name was never changed, so I guess it stuck. In 1970 it moved to Oskarshamn, but they are still making candles. All buildings are gone except for Hovins Malmgård here from 1770, but it's currently in bad shape and is empty as far as I know. I skipped recording the detailing here, as you can see. This is called Gröna Gården, I'm not sure why. It's not green, at least. It risked demolition when Ringvägen was supposed to be extended northwards to Folkangatan through Vitabergen, but that plan was never realized. However, the outhouses behind it are gone. Here is Åseberget with its small cottages. They have all been preserved. Some of the larger houses at Folkengatan have been replaced. This block looks the same today, just a few years earlier it would have been largely empty. This large block is actually two, flaggan and signalen. Maybe I made a mistake here and it actually should be two blocks. I'm not sure when they were separated. Anyway, at some point it looked something like this. I go back and add details soon. These blocks, Bäckbränner and Mindre, also referring to the tar production, and Nybygget were not completed yet. This seems to have been just empty. The ground was probably a few meters higher than the street level here, as the streets recently had been leveled out and broadened.
This block contained Tottiska Malmgården. It was built by the wealthy businessman Charles Totti in around 1770 and was very luxurious. About a hundred years later they were in bad shape when they were taken over by Barningens Tekniska Fabrik making soap and perfume. In the 1920s the buildings were about to be replaced by apartment buildings but a part of it was dismantled and rebuilt at Skansen. I'm going back here for a bit of detailing. This is a bit disorienting, sorry for that. So, what's a Malmgård, anyway? Malmgårdar were summer houses for the rich and noble, often with lavish gardens and gazebos. It's the same Malm as in Södermalm and Norrmalm, denoting a geographical area outside the real city. This is used in some cities in Sweden and Finland. According to Wikipedia, 38 Malmgårdar remain today, most of them on Södermalm. Here is Åseberget again. Many here worked at the shipyard. It was one of the poorest and most miserable areas of Stockholm. The plan was in line with Albert Lindhagen's general city plan to demolish pretty much everything, but then his daughter Anna Lindhagen thought that perhaps some things from old times should be spared. That is perhaps not the whole story, but preserved they were. I'm not sure these fields were used for agriculture anymore, but they definitely were earlier. This part of Södermalm was generally very open, as can be seen in this photo from 1895. This used to be a graveyard but it was no longer in use in 1925. Okay, that was all for this episode. If you like this and want me to continue, please like the video or share it. You can also leave a comment if you have any feedback. Also, if you happen to know some 3D modeling tool like SketchUp or Blender, you can help by creating some buildings. I don't think it should be too hard, I just don't have the time, but it's of course super easy to go back and replace buildings if better matches become available. Until next time, take care.